Wow, Tony exclaimed, sitting back in the chair next to my bed in the master bedroom of my quarters. Drew allowed me to work from my residence after the fever came down. That's a lot of information. My mother knows there are other races besides humanoids, but we have never met them yet, until now. I'm supposed to let them use my indigoid daughter to save a planet from dying, on the word of a fortune teller? This fortune teller, as you call her, has been right all along. You believe the word of a woman who died 50 years ago? Isn't it possible she read the signs just like we did and determined the most likely outcome? After all, their scientists have been fending this off for 100 years. Drew walked into the room at that moment, carrying a picnic basket under one arm. He set it on a table at the end of the bed. Then he moved over to the diag monitor, pressing several buttons. Tony questioned, holding my gaze, then how was she able to predict the birth of two, pure indigoid, uber-empathic people being born close in time to each other? I don't know, but the supervisors had to step in to make the prophecy come to pass about Samantha. I shook my head and demanded, throwing my hands in the air, but why tell me all this now? Why not tell me when my parents tried to pass our family off as humanoids? Drew swung around and required, catching my eye, pass your family off as humanoids? You are not humanoid? If you are not, what are you? Please help us confirm the information my father gave me by doing a scan on my DNA on the cellular level, I requested. He hesitated for a moment, searching my eyes, then turned back to the diag monitor. I watched his fingers dance over the colored buttons on the screen. What the, he exclaimed as he glared at the results, glancing over at me periodically. These are not normal readings on the cellular level for a humanoid. It appears to be a humanoid mutation. He turned to survey me. What are you? I am, according to my father, Indigoid, which is a race of empaths, I confided, resting my head against the pillows, which originates from India 7, one of the planets we are trying to help beyond the wormhole. I can understand if you want to walk away from our commitment. Drew shook his head and decided, it doesn't matter what you are. You are still you, and that is all I need to know. He wrinkled his eyebrows and wondered, did I hear you say something about Samantha fulfilling prophecy? I gave him a grateful smile. I gestured for him to sit on the edge of the bed. Let us fill you in. A few minutes later, Drew responded, Oh my lands, from what I've read, there is no repairing the damage done to India 7. They don't have 10 years. I told my father that. All our scientists' efforts on this project are focused, I responded, looking from Drew to Tony and back again, on the wormhole and how to prevent it from closing in on itself. We have directed our efforts to providing aid and convincing the supervisors to colonize on another planet. We have proposed moving them to one of the moons of India 8, which is inhabitable and has no other inhabitants. From the information I have, they are refusing, Drew assessed, folding his arms across his chest. I pressed my lips together, then agreed, they are, yes, because of the prophecy. That too, pure indigoid, uber empaths would produce a child that would join the supervisors when she is 25? How do highly intelligent people, and from the information we have, Drew questioned, giving me a sidelong glance, they are definitely smart, believe this prophetess. These people knew a hundred years ago that their planet was dying and managed to sustain it until now. Because she has been right. She predicted the drying up of the water supply, Tony countered, darting his eyes from me to Drew and back again several times, the collapse of the banking system and the downfall of the police, not to mention that two uber empaths would be born within two months of each other. They have known about the planet dying for 100 years, I began, holding Tony's gaze. The water drying up would be a natural consequence. If this happened, it would cause a strain on the economy, leading to a banking collapse. As seen in other societies, I continued, looking to Drew, then back to Tony, including those on Earth, when people are struggling financially, they act out against authority. These are all things that could have been predicted through studies of cultures in similar circumstances. However, there is no way for her to predict two uber empaths would be born within two months of each other, Tony charged, running his fingers through his hair. There is no way for her to know that before either of you were even born. I don't know how, Drew decided, stroking his thumb across my hand, but there has to be an explanation. Maybe she time-traveled. She was an uber empath, so, if she had telepathy like my father and I do, is it possible for her to telepathically connect to a person in the future? I know very little about my race. I could have abilities I don't know about. Maybe that explains why I am having dead people give me information in my dreams. Tony shook his head. That's not an indigoid thing. Jessica gets that. Pay attention because they are 100% correct. Who is helping us out? Ethan? No, someone I haven't seen in a while, I said, then gave Drew a sweet smile. He said that he and Ethan would be our team on the other side. Exactly what Jesses calls themselves, Tony revealed, glancing at his timepiece. I've got to go meet Abby. As I watched Tony stand up, I posed, how do you feel about Abby being an indigoid? He stared at me for a moment before answering, it doesn't change anything. She is the same person. He hesitated for a moment and added, glancing at the ground, then up at me, there is something I need to tell you about Abby and me. That you two got married two months ago when you got drunk at a bar on Bravo Minor, I questioned, seeing his eyes widen. I could sense he felt like a teenager who got caught making out with his girlfriend in front of her parents. I have spies everywhere, dear Badger-in-law. Tony laughed and then insisted, I am sober now, I promise, and we are committed to working this out. I gave him a sidelong glance and persisted, you better be, on both accounts. I do not play games when it comes to my careers or my sister. 
So I've heard, Tony confirmed, then moved out the doors. Drew stood and walked over to the end of the bed, picking up the picnic basket. I am done with my shift, and since you are supposed to be recuperating in bed, I thought we could have a nice lunch. He pushed open the lid and retrieved the checkered board blanket, which he spread between us. He brought out containers of every shape and size, along with plates, glasses and silverware. Then I felt anxiety coming from him as he backtracked, I am sorry. I didn't ask you if you were available for a picnic and if you wanted to join me. I think it is sweet, I returned, taking a glass from him. He filled it with lemonade. Like when we first started dating. He poured lemonade into his own glass before he looked at me and asked, What does Dominic look like now? I'm assuming he was the one who came to you. He tilted his head to stare at me as he handed me a wrapped sandwich. Like a younger version of you. He is very handsome, and he is just as smart, but he has my empathic abilities. I moved the wrapper down and bit into the ham and cheese sandwich. My son had empathic abilities? He nibbled on his own ham and cheese sandwich. Our son was a high-functioning empath. I noticed it when he interacted with other children. He was very attentive to the emotions of his friends, I contended, putting the sandwich to my mouth, so much so that one day, he told me that he could feel a little girl's sadness and fear in the daycare center, meeting Drew's gaze as he worked on his sandwich and listened to me intently, and told me how Alicia had marks on her arms and wouldn't talk. I had a friend with Child Protective Services launch an investigation. CPS took her away from her parents because they were abusing her. I took another bite of my sandwich. Why didn't you tell me that Nick and you were empaths, Drew required, put his sandwich on a napkin and picked up his lemonade. It makes me feel like you don't trust me, or think that I can handle, certain information. I didn't tell you because I felt it made Nick and I abnormal and people fear what they don't understand. My mother made me believe I was broken, I maintained, finishing the last bite of my sandwich, that being an empath was something to hide, that people would shun me. I didn't treat Nick differently, but I will admit, folding the wrapper, I didn't announce it either for fear everyone else might. I am sorry. Do you think your mother was jealous because you and your father have more empathic abilities than her? He completed his sandwich. I suppose, but if I were born in fulfillment of this prophecy and she has been so intent on us fulfilling it, then why was she not screaming it from the rooftops because it would mean I was the mother of the chosen child? We sipped our lemonade in silence for a few moments before he took out a clamshell with a piece of chocolate cake in it. He opened the container and handed me a fork. He slid his fork through his end of the cake and put it to his mouth, looking over at me as if he had a question. I focused on his feelings, putting my fork through my end of the chocolate cake. Yes, I did think about you and Nick every day we've been apart. He opened his mouth, then shook his head. Me too. We were such a mess after Nick died, but you seem to be better since you had that dream. Even though I do not get to see him in this realm, I get to interact with him, to hug him in my dreams, and he promised he would be back to help me out on more cases. I suddenly sensed jealousy and drew as I bit the piece of cake off my fork. When I finished eating it, I declared, he wanted me to tell you he loves you and that he will visit you sometime. Drew met my eyes again and stared at me. Really? That is what he told me, yes. I reached out and touched his cheek. He instinctively grabbed it and brought it down to his leg, running his thumb over my hand. I've never stopped loving either of you. I know. I haven't either, but I was wondering if you and Seth would like to join the twins, Samantha and me for dinner tonight. I thought we could watch videos I have of Nick. I think it is time for the kids to know their brother and, for us, to reconnect with our son. He pushed the table settings aside and moved closer to me. He took me in his arms and whispered, you don't know how much I would love that. I actually do. I am an empath, remember? I pulled away from him and explained, I have spent too much of my time blaming myself for Nick's death. I have spent too much time going over that day in my head, feeling what he felt, feeling what you felt, feeling what I felt, but now that I know Nick doesn't blame me, that you don't blame me, I think I can finally be at peace about it. I can finally say his name. I can finally talk about him. He didn't say anything. He just took me back into his arms. I rested my head on his shoulder and realized that this is what he wanted all along, to grieve together, to be able to share our love of our son together. My comlet chimed, followed by Nix's voice, Hey, Alex, can I come see you? I have some information for you, and put LVN on lockdown, or whatever it is that you people do, because word is that the locks are on their way here because someone alerted them to Samantha's whereabouts. I moved away from Drew and slammed my fist into my open palm. My father. It had to be my father. He is the only one of them who knows Samantha is here. I heard my father respond in my head, I told you I wouldn't. I didn't. Have the tracking device removed from her neck, then hide it. Drew, how hard would it be to remove a tracking device from Samantha's neck, I questioned, looking at him. My father told me. Your father? When did you talk to him, Drew required, eyeing me critically. He and I have a telepathic connection. Always have, I answered, holding his gaze. If I explain that later, after the crisis with my daughter's other grandparents is averted, can you answer my question? He searched my eyes before saying, 15 minutes at the most. I moved my legs around to the ground. I pressed my calm lead and charged, Security Chief Garcia, please have one of your guards escort Samantha Locke Madrid from Mr. Fritz's science class and bring her to the hospital. Mix, meet us in the hospital please. I stood and headed to the doors. Drew ran after me and clutched my arm, turning me around, where are you going? We are going to the hospital to get the tracking device out of my daughter. Samantha is in danger. 
He nodded and followed me out the entrance. 